Hello and welcome to today's webinar, the second session of Frontiers of Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning. We've all seen the promise and the reality of artificial, in, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning in our personal lives, whether in our uh, home appliances, like the Nest thermostat or the Roomba vacuum, in our social media feeds, or even in the way the GPS picks her out when we drive, well, back when we drove. We've also seen these technologies fall short in ways both small and large. So as you think about utilizing these technologies in your business, how do you enable their benefits without becoming the next front page story? Our speakers today will speak about these issues, about how machine learning models fail and how to design for that occurrence, how to build trust and privacy through data federation, and how to build collaborative systems that enable humans and machines to work together to deliver better results. I'm Eric Vogan, your host for this session and the Managing Director of Corporate Engagement for MIT's Quest for Intelligence. I will be introducing speakers and moderating your questions after their presentations. If after these sessions you have questions or would like to learn more about the Quest, please contact me and I'd be happy to start a conversation with you. Our co-sponsors for today's events are MIT's Quest for Intelligence and the Industrial Liaison Program. The Quest is MIT's institute-wide artificial intelligence effort bringing together faculty from all five of MIT schools in the College of Computing. The Quest is also one of the research arms of the Schwarzman College of Computing. MIT's Industrial Liaison Program is the primary industry gateway to engage with MIT, with approximately 250 member companies currently a part of the program. The ILP brings MIT to the world through events like this one. And so I'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker this morning, Alexander Madri, Professor in Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory and Director of the Center for Deployable Machine Learning. Alexander will be speaking on the topic, Why Do Machine Learning Models Fail? Please join me in welcoming Alexander. Thanks, Eric, and welcome everyone. Uh, you know, it's great to give a talk. It's too bad it's only virtually, but well, you know, we get what we get. So let me get started. So essentially what I want to talk about today is a question that you know maybe we don't like to ask ourselves because we want to be optimists, but I think we will increasingly need to ask ourselves in the coming future. And this question is, you know, why do our machine learning models fail? Okay. So at first you might ask me, okay, why even I ask this question? Because clearly, like machine learning is an undeniable success story, right? Like we have all these great applications in which machine learning was able to do things that maybe 10 years ago seemed like pure science fiction. So clearly doesn't seem like a failure uh, to end. Uh, like I can't, I can't be really said this is a failure. But you know, so this is all great as a demo and a kind of as a way of showing what is possible out there however you know when you start actually deploying these solutions and you are trying to figure out okay how can i actually use it in the real world well things become a bit nuanced so essentially what we very quickly discover is that as amazing as machine learning currently is it can also be quite unreliable so one of the first ways in which this unreliability was discovered was in the context of so-called adversarial examples so it essentially turns out that Machine learning, uh, machine learning is good on average, but its worst case performance is pretty bad. So yeah, so the like the, the best way to visualize is the adversarial example. So here is one adversarial example when we have a picture of a pig that you know to us looks like a beautiful pig and state of the art classifier identifies this as a pig as well. So everything is as it should. However, what is a bit le more surprising and less desirable is that it's possible to figure out how to add a little bit of noise to this picture. It's not a random noise, it's a carefully chosen noise that results in the picture on the right, which also looks to us as identical pig, but the classifier suddenly believes this is an airliner with very, very high confidence. So this is already first indication that things are not exactly as you would like them to be. But you at least can say here that this noise has to be chosen in a worst case manner. So you can say, well, as long as no one is trying to actively undermine my systems, I am I, well, I, I am fine. Unfortunately, unfortunately, you know, even that is not true. So here is just an example from like a little bit more than a month ago. You know, there's many other examples, but this is just one of the more recent ones, where essentially in the highway, you know, Tesla Model 3, you know, which was using the autopilot, essentially there was a truck overturn on the highway. And just Tesla Model 3 just drove 
just you know into this track without slowing down. Essentially, what happens most likely, and you know, part of the problem is that we don't know what exactly happened, but we at least know what the turn of events was, is that essentially it like this overturn track was such an unusual object to it that it just didn't know what it means. Just assume that probably this, you know, this is nothing to worry about, and it just wanted to confidently, uh, you know, drive forward. And this is by far not the only example where you know Tesla and other self-driving cars failed. So you know, even though no one was kind of actively conspiring here to, you know, to, uh, you know, to undermine this model, it actually failed in a very dramatic way. Okay, so this is the problem, and of course, you know, what in particular my work and the work of many people at MIT is about is figuring out how to avoid this kind of failures, you know, if you really want to find a systematic and, you know, and systemic way to actually fight this brittleness, you need to understand, okay, but like, what is the root of this brittleness? Like, where is this brittleness coming from? Why, why do we even have these problems in the first place? And kind of, so this was a question that me and my group in particular studied for some time. And we start to get to kind of to like, well, we are getting somewhere, I think. In particular, one thing we realize is that kind of at the root of all of this is something is very simple, but very powerful phenomenon. So essentially we as humans, whenever we are trying to solve one of these vision tasks, you know, one of these machine, machine learning classification tasks like dogs versus uh, cats, well, we kind of have our way of solving this problem. We are just thinking, okay, like, you know, to recognize that I have to look at the, you know, at the snout, at the ears and so on. And these are kind of the features that we use to detect is it the dog or is it the cat? And you kind of, and you know, this is definitely works for us, but somehow we also assume that this is the default and only way to solve this problem. It turns out, however, that this is actually totally not the case. And in particular, our machine learning models, by default, they figure out a very different way, a very different set of features to solve the same classification task. So essentially what's happening is that, you know, if we think about any of the vision classification tasks that you want to solve, there are many ways for, uh, for our models to succeed at these tasks. And it turns out that the ways that seem best for the model to solve this task, turn out to be not the ones we expect them to use. And because of that, there is this misalignment between like what we think model is doing versus what the model is actually doing. And that's where kind of all, many of these unreliabilities exactly emerge because models is something very different to what we would expect it to do. Okay, so this is kind of the broad phenomena. And in particular, this notion of adversarial examples is not any kind of glitch of the model. It's just this kind of, you know, it's a question of, you know, it's a human phenomenon because it's a question of like things that, you know, we think should happen, do not happen and vice versa. But it's only because we as humans think that tasks should be solved in one way, not the other. And also this has like important, uh, you know, important implications for interpretability. Essentially it says that if we don't make our models align, human aligned in the first place, there is no hope for them to be interpretable because current models, they tend to make decisions on things that are completely incomprehensible to us. So there is no hope for interpretability. And kind of, we need to figure out additional priors and you know, we can talk about it in the Q&A session, what kind of priors to kind of make the features that model use be, well, the right ones from our point of view. And that in particular is a, is a way towards reliability and interpretability. Okay, so these are the lessons learned but kind of you know you might ask even question okay so you know the root the root problem of uh, of this like of this unreliability is this misalignment but like where is this misalignment coming from like what causes this fact that the models like to solve the classification problems we solve in, in front of them in a different way to how we humans would solve it and kind of the one of the key reasons here like why this misalignment is happening is essentially our models have very simplistic way of solving problems in particular, they are essentially all that they really are at the uh, like you know at the at, at the kind of essence is this they're just excellent correlation extractors. Essentially, all of the predictions are driven by correlations that they identify in the data. So when they are solving cats versus dogs question, they just like figure out features and maybe they're not even the human understandable features that kind of correlate with one class versus other class. So essentially, if there is a particular shape of the ear, if they realize that it appears more often with cats, a cat label versus dog label, this becomes a feature that makes the model believe that you know this is more this is more more likely a cat versus a dog. So this is kind of a very natural way to do learning, but actually this is a very limited way to do learning, and it leads to many of the problems. So you know why is this kind of just this way this mode of learning a problem? Well, 
you know, one problem is that, you know, if uh, like everything that the model is driven by are correlations, then well, such correlations can be planted if we are in the adversarial mode. So in particular, there is this notion of backdoor attacks, essentially which shows that you can use your ability to manipulate as an adversary, just a tiny part of training data to fully control uh, the behavior of the model that was trained on this data. Okay, so here is just an example. So you can imagine that you have a kind of, you, you can, you know, essentially make, uh, like what you can do is you can get this power that like any model that is trained on this data, which, you know, tiny fraction of it you manipulated. And what happens is that, you know, like now, whenever there is like a, one input you want to manipulate. So this is a van and it's for now correctly recognized by a model as a van, but you can actually make the prediction be whatever you want by just planting uh, you know, pre-arranged or kind of pre, like, you know, pre-selected, you know, watermark trigger pattern that you put on the image. So essentially, like, it is a, like the image of the left is a van to a model, but the moment I add some particular signature, I kind of, I chose ahead of time, I can make this input be immediately classified as any other class of my choosing, you know, just by planting this one signal in there. Okay, so essentially, like, so this completely subverts the model from any point of view of security. So if this, if, if this was kind of automatic passport check, you could maybe put some funny glasses, and whenever you put these glasses, you know, the model identifies you as someone completely different than uh, actually it should. So you might ask again, what is the mechanism behind this? And essentially, the mechanism is exactly that what you are doing is in the training data, you plant a fake useful, cor useful correlation with you know, the class dog. You kind of somehow make the model believe that whenever this watermark is present, well, the correct class is dog. And this is exactly like what this like correlation learning is you know, one way in which this makes model fail. But this is by far not the only reason why this you know, big correlation extractor is a problem. There is also like the problem is that this kind of spurious correlations already exist. So you don't need any adversary to plan them into your data sets. They already are there is already quite a bit of you know, misleading uh, correlations in the, in the data set already. So, uh, you know, like one thing to realize in particular when you work with data is that like these correlations can be very weird and uh, kind of uh, completely surprising to us. So for instance, one thing we notice when we like we're looking at dogs versus cats uh, task, well, essentially that, you know, one thing that turns out to be the case is that people like to put bow ties on their pets. You know, they do. And, you know, we train on images just are kind of, you know, uh, sourced from the web. So, you know, essentially these are uh, largely just, you know, images of the, pet, of the pets that, you know, uh, people upload on the web. And it turns out that for some reason, you know, okay, so there's only a small fraction of pets that have any bow ties on them. But when, when the bow tie is on a, like on a pet, it tends to be more likely to be on the cats versus the dogs. Maybe cats look more handsome in the bow tie. I don't know what is the reason, but what is the consequence is that now the model thinks that the presence of a bow tie is actually a signal for being a cat. So if you have a picture of a dog and you put a bow tie on it, you suddenly made it more cat-like, even though, of course, to us, this is a nonsense. So of course you can say, okay, well, you know, who cares about, this is just like a funny kind of a funny uh, anecdote, you know, like who cares about such things, you know, like in the end, this is just a dogs versus cats classification problem. But it turns out that exactly the same uh, problems emerge in much, much, much more serious context. So in particular, as you know, one of the big promises of, you know, of machine learning is to use it for like, you know, in, in the medical imaging. So in, in particular, people wanted to design a machine learning algorithm that, you know, given an X-ray of a chest recognizes, let's say, if there is, you know, if there is tuberculosis or not in this picture, if you can detect tuberculosis or not. So they train the, like they get the training set, they train the model and the model seemed to work really, really well, like better than a human. And kind of, there was this kind of whole article that said that, you know, uh, essentially like radiologists will be out of jobs in, within five years from now. So that was all great at the first glance, but then they looked a bit closer. And what they realized is that actually like the, the model that they trained seems to pay a lot of attention to the type of the X-ray machine that took the picture. You know, and this was very puzzling. And finally, they figured out why. Essentially, what figured out, uh, like what they figured out, is that well, tuberculosis is a very rare disease in the developed world. So to get the positive cases for the training, you needed to source the images from less developed countries. And less developed countries tend to use uh, like older X-ray machines or maybe portable X-ray machines. So essentially, the type of machine suddenly becomes a strong indicator whether to the model whether you know this picture it corresponds to a you know, to a tuberculosis, positive tuberculosis case or not. 
So again, this kind of this correlation is not causation kind of effect suddenly becomes very dangerous because it undermines the whole reliability of the detection tools. And you know, there are other cases like that where you know detecting if the change in the skin is malignant or not turns out to be very sensitive to whether the, there is a ruler in the in the picture or not because picked, because doctors when they actually do this kind of pictures they tend to put a ruler for reference there so this becomes actually a signal because you get from doctors you get usually the positive positive cases and for whatever people will you know put on the web is usually the negative cases so kind of so this can these things happen and again kind of the pattern here is that patterns that seem to be predictive as in helping you with solving the classification task that you kind of set in front of the model might not be actually good. They actually not, might not be what you actually would like the model to use. Okay. So, you know, so what I wanted to tell you about is just like that this goes even further today. Kind of, I wanted to kind of dive even deeper and say essentially like, okay, so you might say, okay, someone here was silly. They didn't source the images the right way because, you know, they took like the, the positive images from one source, negative from other source. Okay, so this you can control for, but it turns out again, that this is kind of much more tricky than that. So it turns out that even our way we train the model currently itself introduces such an undesirable biases. So just to kind of start with something very simple. So we just like did the study of the dependence of our models on the background scene. Okay, so essentially you are thinking of you know, images in our like image and data set, which is one of the popular, you know, uh, you know image uh, classification tasks. And you have like a foreground, uh, you know, uh, object, which is what you are supposed to classify. And then of course there is some background. Okay, and what you wanted to understand is exactly like how much information there is conveyed by the background. And what happens if you start to kind of mix and match the you know, foreground object with different, you know, with different backgrounds, maybe taken from images from a different class. So you know, one thing that we discovered you know, is that this background signal actually carries much of model accuracy. So essentially like, you know, this background is really a fairly strong signal for models that, and, and models actually do use the signal. Again, this shouldn't be too surprising because so do humans. It's like if you see your, you know, uh, your uh, work colleague somewhere, you know, during your vacations, it will take you a while to recognize the face because the background and the context will be different. So this alone is not surprising. What maybe is more surprising is things like this. So it turns out that this kind of the models tend to over rely on the signal. So in particular, there's this notion of adversarial backgrounds. So for a large majority, like uh, over 87% of inputs, you can essentially make the model fail, but like by taking, you know, the proper object, foreground object that's supposed to, supposed to classify, and you just change the background to one of the worst case backgrounds. And you can essentially like, you can find the background that fools the model for most of the inputs. Okay, so it's not only that for every, every foreground object, there is a bad background, actually it turns out that there are backgrounds that are very misleading for many objects. So here are just some examples of them. So my favorite one is the one in the bottom left corner, when essentially like having a human hold something like this makes the model believe that this is very likely a fish, no matter what this object is. You know, just, it just, and again, just if you think about all these like correlations here that are coming in here, this is kind of quite surprising. So you no, know, because you know, second photos from the internet, people usually kind of photograph themselves, you know, when they want to show the kind of prey they, uh, uh, they fished. So essentially, you know, so, so that's where this bias is coming from. The other funny bias is that the natural habitat for crab turns out to be, to be a plate because, you know, again, people photograph crabs, you know, uh, in the restaurant. So kind of the model believes that this is natural habitat for a crab to be on a plate. Okay, so these are this kind of uh, examples of biases. And of course you might ask yourself, okay, so what can I do to avoid this kind of over-reliance on backgrounds? And you know, we show, as we show in the papers, there are some like, once you know, what to control for, you can do, do things. So for instance, by randomizing the background versus the foreground, you can essentially like break this, you know, you can break this, uh, you know, these biases, unfortunately also sacrificing the signal because there is some useful signal there that actually you might not want to, uh, uh, to, sac uh, to sacrifice, but at least this, you know, this essentially largely mitigates this problem of adversarial backgrounds. And also what we did discover is that like essentially as our, uh, image net model increase, they actually become more background robust. So like the more recent image net model actually also become more background robust. It doesn't mean they don't depend on background. They actually do depend on background, but they depend on background in a, in a kind of smart way. So they, they use the signal, but they don't over rely on it. And kind of, so you can't really fool them by just changing the background. 
So essentially, so, so this is kind of a you know small, small inquiry into this. But again, you know, here at least like this kind of once I told you about this background versus foreground uh, biases, you can see like you can clearly see that you know yeah of course that's what will be happening. Yes, you should control for it. But again, there's nothing surprising. But you know, I just wanted to tell you about one more you know much more subtle case in which kind of these undesirable biases arise. And kind of it's important because it actually, uh, you know, it actually corresponds to one of the widely used data sets, uh, essentially, that like essentially many of the, at least in the research, like, you know, most of the research is done using the data set. And there are some subtle biases there that people don't fully realize and kind of we identify. Here. Okay, so this, you know, this data set is called the ImageNet. And essentially, like, we want to kind of show you that there are some like very subtle, like, you know, in contrast to the previous ones, there are some very subtle biases there that one might not even realize they are there at, 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 at first. And kind of the point of start here is just like, these are three examples of images from this image and data set. And there are three example labels, like essentially for each, for each image, we provided a label, which is a valid uh, image net label. And if I just show you these three, the three pictures and the corresponding labels, you might say, okay, this looks like, you know, essentially like whoever chose these labels, they did great job. They figured out how to properly label this, you know, these images. However, it turns out that if you look at ImageNet, what the correct ImageNet label for these images is, well, actually all of three of these labels were wrong. And these are the correct labels. Okay, so we may say, oops, you know, someone is not as good as ImageNet as they should be. But like then if you, you know, think about it a bit more, you ask, okay, but like what was wrong with that labels? Like they didn't really seem to be less correct than the uh, pro, like the supposedly correct labels here. So kind of like, so even though supposedly we are kind of like misclassifying these images, it doesn't really feel like we are really doing that. And there is something kind of weird going on here in terms of like, you know, what the ground truth, image and ground truth is. So essentially, you know, uh, uh, kind of this is, this is something that we are starting looking into and said, okay, so where are these kind of problems like this coming from? So where could be like, what could be the problem here? And kind of we realize that the problem here is that, you know, the way this data set is created might be again, a bit different to how we imagine it is created. Okay, so essentially like usually when we think about the, you know, about the data set creation, we have this idealized, you know, pipeline in mind in which we say, okay, someone goes out there, takes all the images they can get their hands on, and then they have an expert annotator go over each image and figure out which of the potential, like, you know, for images is like 1000 classes, you know, this image, like, you know, like, like, like fits best. Okay, so this is kind of how we like to think about labeling of, you know, of, of machine, of data sets in, in machine learning. But this is like, this is totally not how it could be possible to do. Like if you want to have these data sets of millions of images, you can't afford to do it. Like, you know, just think about it, like just having human figure out which of the 1000 classes is correct one, that's already a daunting task. Now multiply it time millions of images. Okay, so this is kind of how we like to think about uh, how annotations are, are obtained, but this is not how they are obtained. And what people do instead is something a, a bit different, like something clever actually. So what they do, they kind of start from the other side. They, instead of trying to start with the images and then find the correct labels, they go the other way around. They just first figure out what are the labels they would like to have in the data set. And then for each label, they go to like some, you know, a, you know, image search engine and they just like put, you know, this label into the search engine and just see what images come up for this query. And then they of course have some like, you know, validation process and they use like mTurk as like some crowdsource validation to do that. And essentially what they do is just say, okay, so for each of such image that they got as a result of putting term, you know, a, a term, you know, kind of a, a, like class X into the, you know, image search, you know, they ask, you know, mTurkers, okay, so is this, you know, is this image, and does this image actually contain an object of class X? Okay, and if enough fraction of them says yes, then you say, okay, so this clearly seems like a good, like correct label for this image. And that's how you add it to your data set with this label. So this is kind of nice because this is kind of very scalable. Like, especially if you like do this queries in batches, you just need several queries per image to get kind of, you know, this answer to your question and kind of creating data set. But there's a big problem here. Essentially what we are doing here, we are asking a very leading question. 
we always, for a given image, we always have this only one single candidate label. And we just ask, you know, does this label fit this image? Yes or no. And also, we don't even ever make the uh, laborer aware that essentially there is, you know, that there could be some other potential labels for this image. You know, they just assume this is all asking isolation. Okay, so you already should see that there is a problem with this, that kind of these leading questions can kind of distort the results. And kind of what we did in our recent work, we tried to just try to see, okay, so this could be a problem. You know, how much of a problem this actually is? So essentially, so we, we looked into it and we found a, a bunch of quite disturbing things. So first of all, what we discovered is that actually a quite large fraction of, image, of ImageNet images is actually multi-object images. So these are actually images where you know humans could at least find two different objects from uh, like you know from two different classes in an image. So here is just an extreme example. Here we have like like uh, really a lot of you know a lot of objects that correspond to different you know to two different classes. So in some ways you know if you just ask for a single label for an image. Like for these objects, this that like for these images, it doesn't make sense because there is at least or like at least two valid answers there. Okay, and actually this turns out to affect accuracy. So essentially, if you plot your performance on the only the single object images versus the multi-object images, so of course your performance on the multi-object images tends to be much worse. It's kind of like roughly ten percent performance drop. Okay, so you see this difference. So it does. Uh, much much better on the single object images than the you know multi object images. But now when you know that there are multi object images, you kind of know what is the problem, and you can just try to fix it by essentially accepting any answer that you know corresponds to one of the objects in the in the image. And when you improve this kind of you know performance evaluation, you suddenly this gap this gap disappears, and it turns out that this was kind of the major reason why we were underperforming on this you know twenty percent of the images that we are testing our models on. Okay, so that's one kind of bias and problem with evaluation that we identify, but there is more. So in particular now that we know that the, for some images there is more than one valid label and more than one valid object to, to choose from, you can ask, okay, so, but like, you know, the image that label and the models, like, you know, which, which object do they settle on? Because they have to make a decision. And the answer is that actually the objects that both the image net co correct class and the models tend to settle on are actually not what annotators would view as the main object in the picture. So essentially for, 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 for many reasons, essentially like things that you as a human, if I ask you, okay, you know, for the middle picture, should the label be bow tie or should it be the, the label be suit? You know, probably your instinct would be to say this is a suit because this kind of looks like this is the main object in the picture. But you know, for reasons that like you no know, come from the way the in, in images were sourced, bow tie turns out to be what ImageNet pays attention to. And kind of essentially what happens is that models, of course, they want to perform well according to image net labels. So they turn out to over focus on this kind of small details like bow tie, like the speaker haube, and kind of miss the big picture quite a bit. Okay. So, you know, so these are kind of just some of the problems that we found that kind of come from this, you know, from this data set biases. But you know, you may also ask, okay, so but like how good image net models are if instead of looking at just image net labels, we actually ask humans to evaluate the result. So essentially, each time the model gives a prediction, we just don't compare it against the image that label, but instead we ask humans, okay, so is it essentially a valid label for this image? And what we find is that the good news is that essentially, like, as we are improving our models on this kind of image net benchmark, they also tend to improve according to the human-based evaluation. And in fact, we go to a moment where annotators cannot anymore tell the difference between like a like kind of what is the more correct answer, whether the image net one or the one that the models supply. So in some ways, it might be that if our baseline is just non-expert annotators on image net, and then essentially maybe image net is outlived its usefulness. And maybe like where we are now, it's essentially end of the line. And if you want to go beyond that in terms of performance on the benchmark, we might be forcing model to kind of try to overfit to the task as opposed to actually get closer to the human-based kind of no, non-expert annotator or based. Okay, so this is roughly like all I wanted to, to tell you. So essentially I really wanted to do the deep dive into kind of, you know, all this like biases that you probably did not think about before, but actually are there and they really uh, kind of manifest themselves later through unreliability. 
So, you know, I guess the takeaway is that like what models do and do not learn from our, you know, classification task is not always clear. It might not be what you expect them to learn. So models are great at essentially extracting correlations, which make them be affected by biases, both the one in the world, like the background versus foreground, but also in our data pipeline. It's just the way we source images, the way we label them and the way we evaluate models. And kind of this correlation extractor is this like double-edged sword of ML. Like this is what gives our models power, predictive power, but also this is something that makes them fail when kind of we don't control for this difference between like correlation and causality. And, you know, we really need to study these issues before focusing on improving performance on a given benchmark. So essentially the benchmark is only as good as it models the real intended task. We, we, we suppose this benchmark to model. And especially if you think about robustness, we have to be aware of like, what are we asking our models to do? And, you know, how do we, you know, how do we evaluate the performance? Because this will drive what the model will learn from the data and how what it learns can be manipulated either intentionally or unintentionally when the model is deployed. Okay, so that's all uh, I have to say. And yeah, I'm happy to take questions. Excellent, thank you very much, Alexander. Um, a couple of questions have come up as you've been talking and I'm going to try to collapse some of these down. Um, one question focused around whether or not the human interpretability of the various features impact the ability of the, uh, of adversarial attacks against the algorithm. In other words, do we have to be able to recognize that there's a bow tie in the picture to be able to fool the algorithm into thinking a dog is a cat? Or are there subtler variations that can be made to enable these kinds of um, uh, failures in the machine learning models? Yes, yeah, so if you are as an attacker, if you actually want to undermine this model, uh, then yeah, you don't have to go to any of these great lengths. Like there are some simple ways of figuring out what modifications to the image or to the object will make you know, will make the, you know, this model mispredict. So we don't have to get this very deep understanding of what the model is doing. And like, essentially, like you can kind of automatically discover what are the features that will make the model mispredict. And they don't have to be as human understandable as adding a bow tie. They just like sometimes just changing some like lighting, some kind of some things that again, there's weird features that, that non-robust models use that will trigger the model to, to, to miss the misprediction. However, if you think about defending against these examples, then kind of, yes, I do believe that ultimately you have to, you know, get a better understanding of what is, what does your model pay attention to when classifying things. In particular, we do know by the way that, you know, okay, so it's clearly like interpretability allows you to get robustness because you know how your model fails, if it fails and how to kind of reverse engineer, like how to engineer it for it to not fail because of this, you know, misaligned uh, prompts. But actually we know that robust models tend to be interpretable, more interpretable by, uh, to begin with. Essentially like the representation tend to be more human aligned. And this is something we discovered in our work as well. So this kind of, there's a very tight connections on the defense. Excellent, thank you. Um, another question asked around uh, about unbalanced data sets and attempts to try to, to balance those um, through synthetic data. Um, I think you talked about this a little bit when you were talking about the way that the uh, research was carried out with ImageNet, where um, from the labels, uh, researchers are um, using a search engine to find other examples of um, uh, that label. Um, mm -hmm. Are there ways, in as you think about it, to utilize a synthetic data set or to expand data sets that um, are robust to um, these kinds of uh, biases or, or adversarial attacks? Well, it's kind of tricky, right? Because the problem with synthetic data is in the end, you will like you will only learn what you put in there, right? So in some ways, yes, if you kind of, so, so, so the answer is yes and no, right? Like, so I think uh, adding synthetical, uh, you know, kind of uh, changes, it's, it's a good thing to debias the model sometimes. Like when you know what the bias is, you can kind of make the model like break these biases by, so this was the example of the foreground and background dependence that like by mm -hmm. mixing this and essentially like getting the synthetic inputs that, you know, that uh, essentially, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, that kind of are uncorrelated, you fixed, you broke this, you know, uh, you broke this, uh, this dependency. But if in terms of learning, well, you need the real data to actually, you know, like make the model learn. If you don't do that, then you will be in trouble. So yeah, so if you understand what the bias is, you could use synthetic data to de-bias it. But if you don't know what it is, it will not help. 
and you know, a, a question um, came up around um, the labels associated with ImageNet. Um, as a human being, and and not as a dog breeder, I look at the um, the different labels for the American Staffordshire Terrier, and I say, yeah, those are equivalent. I think there are a lot of cases where um, uh, forcing the system to choose one label over another has uh, potentially led us down the rabbit hole. Um, how do you deal with situations with multiple correct labels? Is it possible that ImageNet's time has come and we need a more advanced system that allows us to associate um, uh, a, a number of different labels? And then how do you think about um, synonyms and uh, collapsing uh, meanings for uh, various levels of representation? Yeah, so, so that's excellent. Yeah, so, so I like that's exactly my, you know, uh, that's exactly my kind of uh, conclusion that like we need to get more fine grained annotations for our images. Uh, and uh, essentially what happens is that, you know, uh, essentially like, yeah, we need to figure out a way in which, you know, we can communicate if there is more objects than one in the image, you should like communicate to the model. If, you know, there are synonyms in your, you know, in your allocation, you should also kind of make the model aware and kind of evaluating like if it mentions one of them, it will be correct or not. So yeah, so, so this is exactly the, the thing that like ImageNet was very useful, but you have to remember that ImageNet was created with a very simplistic goal in mind. It was just meant as a kind of way for, you know, a, as a kind of way to just set up this like, you no, know, 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, just like set up this challenge of, you know, of how to, you know, of how to, actually, you know, of how to, uh, like, yeah, there was just like, give us a difficult task in vision. And it mm. served this purpose well, and it went way beyond that. But no one, when they were creating it, they never thought about this, that this would be a golden standard of what, you know, object recognition will be. So that's, you know, uh, uh, that's why we don't have it currently, but it's important for us to realize that, you know, this, again, it was a very useful uh, like data set, but it outlived its usefulness right now. And we need to give this more rich annotations to kind of guide our models properly. And, and how does that same concept of, of labels and, and expanding the, the uh, data set and, and in some space, uh, some sense, the model space, how does that interlace with your first uh, concept about, um, you know, foreground, background, fooling the models? Are there ways to incorporate um, uh, representations of the, the various depths of field in uh, particular images or, you know, as you start to think about other contexts with information where uh, there's a, a high level takeaway versus the fine grained data. Are, are there thoughts about building systems that can accommodate that? Yes, so, so that's exactly what we are working on. It's exactly like, you know, okay, so the, the easy answer is just say, okay, so you can add like the banding boxes to your data set. Actually, image that has banding boxes for some of these images when you just say, okay, you should only pay attention to this part of the image to recognize, you know, uh, to recognize, you know, why, what is the object that, you know, is in this picture. But you know, of course, this has to currently be annotated by humans. So the question would be like how to get like semi-automatic at least ways of kind of exactly like honing in of what mm. is like, you know, what one should be paying attention to versus what one shouldn't be paying attention to. And essentially, you know, like so one kind of, uh, you know, uh, like the, the one way we kind of envision this happening is essentially by asking humans not only to kind of annotate the images themselves, but actually ask, you know, whenever the model misclassifies something, we ask the model kind of, can you morph this image in a way that will kind of misclassify you even more? Like, can you tell us what made you think that this incorrect classification was correct for this image? And mm -hmm. then kind of send it to humans and ask them, okay, here is what the model paid attention to. Can you kind of give the model guidance of like, is it wrong, is it right, and so on. So kind of, but yeah, it's still very much and you know, open field of research of how to provide at least a semi-automatic pipeline for kind of providing this more guidance to the models in a sample efficient way. Excellent, thank you very much. And with that, I think we've come to the end of our time segment. So really wanted to thank you for the presentation. Very, very interesting work. And uh, we'll move on to our next speaker.